Good afternoon, my name is Topper Heathen and we're in my house in Dover and I've got Spike Web with me. Oh, sorry, I've got Spike Wibbly Web with me and uh, we're going to talk about his book, Mad, Bad and Dangerous, which is a story of drummers, by drummers, for drummers, and uh, I am the main star and the person who's actually selling all the copies of the book, really. So I will be negotiating a substantial <laughs> fee after the interview. <laughs> First question, Topper. Yeah. First question. Uh, in the book, we talk about, or you talk about, your involvement with uh, Rock the Casbah. In fact, you wrote yeah. it. Yeah. Apparently, that was at a studio waiting for the other members of the Clash. Yeah. Was it? Was it there that you started writing it? No, I. I had it. I've been working on the idea on the piano for quite a while on the on the piano yeah. chords, and by the time we came to record Combat Rock, which is the album it was on, we were kind of on our last legs anyway. Yeah. And we weren't exactly getting on too well. And uh, I turned up at the appointed time in the studio, which was, I think, midday. And Mick and Paul were late and Joe was late. And uh, I thought, right, here's a chance to get the piano track oh, down. Yeah. So I put the piano track down. And uh, sorry, no, I didn't. I put the drum track down first to yeah. play the piano too, thinking that they would turn up and, and I could say that well, this work on this is an idea. And they still weren't there. So I decided after I put the piano on top of the drums, I put the bass down. Yeah. Because I can play the bass in D and I can play the piano in D, uh, and they still didn't show up, so I put some percussion on. And uh, by the time Joe and Paul got there and Mick got there, I said I'd like to play this idea, and they listened to it and they went, "Well, that's great. That's you don't we don't have to do anything. We, we can it. go." Yeah. So I said, "Wait a minute." I said, uh, "I said it's I've only done half of it. It's it's supposed to be like four verses and two choruses and." Yeah an intro and, and so they said well we can splice the tape because in those days we had that two yeah. inch tape Which you cut with scissors so, yeah or yeah. a razor blade and stuff so they spliced it and, and made the, the the backing track twice as long joe then went into the toilets and within about 15 20 minutes he came out with the words so what and, the and that was written it, in yeah. a, in a... then because mick hadn't been involved up until now uh he went into the studio and put his wristwatch on it much to my annoyance, <laughs> but uh, he, you know, he had to be in, in on that track. And it turned out to be a Clash <laughs> bestseller, didn't it? Yeah. One of the best-selling records it's, of Clash. Which is, yeah, which was rather strange because I wasn't, the, you know, obviously Mick and Joe wrote all the music, you know, they were the good songwriters. And so, so I, I, I like the fact that the drummer wrote one of the best-selling <laughs> Yeah, I'm very ironic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, on my last, I was in the last throws of being thrown out anyway, you know, it was... Uh, <laughs> A swan kind of, song almost. Life, yeah, life is ironic because then about six months later I was in Los Angeles having what was called the black box treatment for heroin addiction yeah. that Pete Townsend paid for me to have and while I'm sick in bed feeling, you know, desperate really, yeah. the, the Clash were playing at the US Festival down the road in front of about 200,000 people. Yeah. And boy, did that hurt. Yeah, you know? I'm sure. Well, there's another thing that goes, a theme that goes through the book, which is something we try and investigate a little bit, is that our drummers are actually a little bit mad. <laughs> or do people just think we are? Not just the ones who drive cars into swimming pools, but the, the one, you know, do, do you have to be a little bit bonkers to want to do it in the first place? I think, so. I think it's a combination. I think, obviously, to start off drumming, it's not like any other instrument, is it? It's, uh, you know, there's no, no notes. You, you can't you know, play tunes, you have to kind of just learn, and it's a noise to start with. It's very isolational, you know, you, you sit in a room on your own making so much noise that people don't come near you. And... So you've got to spend, a, you know, six months or a year or so before yeah, you can even share time. it with anybody yeah, else. Yeah, a long time before you can even think about playing with other musicians. Either but it's, a, it's an obsessive thing to do, I yeah. think. For me, anyway, yeah. speaking personally, drums work for me. Once I discovered drumming, it was a total obsession. You know, that took the, took the place of everything, took the workplace of school and took the place of any thought yeah. of, I wasn't going to be anything else. You yeah. know, when yeah. I discovered drums, my mind was made up. The I same here pretty well. I mean, I used yeah. to play the drums on the, on the, the desk I think it might be the same, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, if it hadn't worked out for me, I'd have probably been in trouble later on in life because I, I had no education. But it what is an obsession and it's, you know, if, if, if you're going to become a successful at everything, you have to be... Do it to the exclusion uh, of everything else. Yeah, I found that if you if you stop playing for a while, you don't realise. But when you play, when you start playing again, it gives you an enormous lift when you start. Mm. You know, if you give it, if you leave it for a month or two. Well, I left it for years yeah. to be honest with you, because of my addiction. It was only when I got clean, which is about eight years ago now, that all of a sudden I just wanted to play again. You know, and uh, 
and you yeah. enjoy it more now than ever before. Yeah, so. I love it. I play it for fun. I play it for fun now. Mm. You know, there's no pressure to because I have to be careful. If I was to start doing gigs again reg on a regular basis, you know, there's you know, there's always you're always around drink and yeah. soft drugs at least. You know, yeah, so yeah. I don't want to take that risk. Yeah. And, uh, and who are you playing for at the moment? Well, I played no one really. I'm playing for myself. I just yeah. showed you a bit on the internet yeah, I was about say, what's the, name the band called Sandy. That's it. Sandy. The Canterbury yeah. uh, Music Festival, which is kind of nice African jazz funk yeah. type music, which was fun. But just odd gigs here and there, you know. It's uh, we were talking earlier about the effort yeah. of, of dismantling a kit, setting it up, putting it in the van, dismantling it, all that stuff. It's kind of well, it's work, isn't it? It's yeah. Right, isn't it? <laughs> as, as, what's the toughest time you had to play a gig? You, you mentioned earlier something about being. Uh, you were injured or your back or something? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we, constantly on the road with the Clash. It was like very, such a physical thing. You know, my hands were always covered in blood blisters. Yeah. You know, and I had to tape them up and it was quite painful. But there was one occasion that we were playing piggyback fighting in a hotel. And I, I think I was on Paul's shoulders and I went crashing off. And I remember being pain, pain at the time. To cut a long story short, I'd fractured my pelvis. Oh, yeah. But we were in the middle of a tour and we, you know, you don't stop. Yeah. And uh, to this day, I, when I wake up in the morning, it hurts because my pelvis never set, you know. So Baker, my drummer, he used to, had to lift me up, put me on the drums, and I would play, and then he had to help me off the riser at the end. The riser at the end. <laughs> One piggyback fight, you wish yeah, you never had. but we were just kids, you know, just when, yeah. when you're young, you don't think that they might... We were talking about being deaf a minute ago, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I knew that there was, you know, when I was, I was warned when I was playing the drums, it wasn't good for your hearing. Yeah. You know, but it didn't bother me when I was young. Now, with a bit of tinnitus and people blurring into the background and the TV on really loud, you know, it's kind of... Not being able to talk but I wouldn't room change people. It. Yeah, but I wouldn't change it. I no, was about to say, it, I wish I'd listened, but I don't. It's worth it. Well. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, when you were first playing as, um, uh, in a band as, um, as, a, as a youngster, yeah. um, have you found, did you find that um, when you set up your drums, that you're constantly being told to move them or, or oh, get yeah, out of the way? Oh yeah, you're always in the way. They're always to shut up yeah. and, uh, and that, that sort of thing. It's well, like, that's the thing, that's another thing why drummers are different from other musicians, because when, yeah. you, when you're warming up on a drum kit, it's loud. Plus the fact when you, when you set up someone on a drum kit, you're there for the night. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you, you set your drums up and then you're always, the bass player wants you to move to the right or the singer wants you to move back and it's too late because you set the yeah. drums up. Yeah. And, you so know, you find yourself sort of pulling well, the carpet did, along yeah, the floor drummers, trying to get them all to move at yeah, once. It's, I think, you know, drummers, we, you were saying, I think drummers, when to start off playing the drums, you're slightly different to other musicians. Yeah. And then as time goes on, you alienate yourself from other musicians because you're noisy. Yeah. You know, you always, I was always tapping between takes and, you know, ruining takes. And So it's nice when you get to the stage where other people are setting it up and, and everyone else is, yeah, is yeah, yeah. taking that on board. That's when you enjoy it more, which is when you've got more chance to socialise, which of course brings you in contact with things like drink and drugs and all yeah. that and stuff. So that begins to take over and, and uh, so you have access to the party uh, uh, almost infinitely and then that's, that's when it, it sort of starts to get overlap and all that kind well, of thing. Well, I think so. I mean, I remember... You know, I used to love touring. I was only happy when we were touring. Yeah. But the others used to find it quite tiring. You know, yeah. it's uh, it's just the way it was. I love being on the road because it was one big party. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I, as you know, I got into trouble because it was one big party. But that's my personality. You know, I, I like party. Yeah. Or I yeah. used to like parties, and it was great to be on tour because that was a thirty-day party. Yeah. And it's kind of difficult, isn't it, when? When you're a drummer, because it takes... I mean, of course it does about musicians as well. It, 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 it's, it's lacquering for everybody. But mm. when you're on such a high after you've played, um, you can't just suddenly stop no. functioning. You have to do something. So unless you go swimming or running or something like mm. that, I mean, you're, you're, you're going to party, aren't you? You know, Because you've got yeah. to get rid of all that excess energy. I you know? remember waking up every morning on tour thinking, I'm not doing that, I'm getting an early night tonight. Because yeah. I used to feel like dreadful first week yeah. in the morning I think right I'm getting an early night and as the day progressed you'd have a drink here and then you'd have something to go on stage and then you'd come off stage and you'd be so hyper and high from, you'd forgotten about from, the not from and drugs but yeah. from actually playing and adrenaline yeah, yeah. that you'd take four or five hours to, to wind down and you'd drink to wind down and then you'd feel even worse next day yeah. but so you, it was that constant like grand old yeah. day today gonna, that's it yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting yeah. an early night tonight straight yeah. after the gig I'm going to sleep yeah. She's madness, you don't. But you physically can't, can't you? Because if, if you were to lie down, you'd just stare at the ceiling. Yeah. You, can't, you, you just cannot, no matter how physically tired you are, you're so wound up. 
Yeah, high. So it's got to go word, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, high. You know, yeah. The, to to me, adrenaline and performing in front of a big audience is the best drug you can get. Yeah. And to get over that, you've got to have another type of drug. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> unless, yeah, as I yeah. say, you go running or yeah. jumping or, or, or whatever. Or you're not a drummer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or unless... <laughs> It's the most knackering thing you can do. In that. I suppose singers have a problem, because that's quite knackering, especially yeah. if you run around a lot like Jagger. Well, Joe, like Joe used to have a lot of tr trouble with his voice. Yeah. You know? yeah. In fact, all the, you know, the Clash was such a, a, you know energetic band. I saw Paul recently, He's, he has trouble with his hip from where the bass is constantly smashed yeah. against it. You yeah. know? And, it was and, a, and Joe used to, do, used to play really st quite yeah. st heavily staccato, didn't he? And yeah. that stamp and his always his fingers band. used to be bleeding. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he'd and stamp he the ground with his foot as well at the yeah. same time as well. Yeah. Wasn't he? And he used to have a, a guard on his arm because yeah. he used to have terrible burns on his yeah. arm from rubbing the guitar. Yeah. So to be yeah. fair, it isn't it isn't just the drummer that has the um... certainly with the clash it wasn't. No. With the no. clash it was the, the four of yeah. us that were you know, and we would all collapse in a heap yeah. after a gig, you know. And... But fun nonetheless, worth oh, it. Oh yeah, yeah. Do it all again. Which with is kinda of sad really. Yeah. <laughs> The Clash have a lot, quite a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of stuff about the Clash at the moment, isn't there? There's a lot of um, articles and, and yeah. kind of. Uh, um, they've still got. Pro I mean, how many millions of fans do you reckon the Clash have? But it seems to grow in importance. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's strange. When I was up in London recently, met met up with Mick and Paul. We were yeah. all saying, "What a mad life it's been!" Because our, our dreams and ambitions, etc., were over by the time we were 27, 28. Yeah. Yeah. We've done, I, I personally had done everything I wanted to achieve by the time I was 27 and none of us have been able to follow the clash no. you know what I mean and, 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 and whilst we haven't tried to follow it it has grown and grown in importance yeah. you know the Ivan Novello Award for yeah. outstanding contributions to music and the rock and roll yeah. the fame and it's been strange you know yeah, yeah. I mean I, my money today comes from something I did 30 years ago yeah. which does seem a bit strange <laughs> sometimes you know but it was, yeah, but it's Rock the Casper in the studio, a few hours, and, and you yeah, know, that kind yeah. of... Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Was I, was I talented and hard-working, or was I just lucky? I think it's... It's often a bit of both, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. sometimes I wake up and yeah. I think, yeah, well, you were a great drummer. And other times, I, yeah. mornings, I think, this is mad. Well, I, I, I enjoyed watching what you were doing in there earlier. Yeah, I still, I still keep my hand in, you know, so... <laughs> yeah. It's... it's um, it's a, it's a rocky road, isn't it, the, the drumming? But yeah. then, you know, it's something that also releases so much in you as well. I've been talking about highs and that kind of thing, as you were saying. I mean, it it does tend to give you something a bit a bit special in terms of your own psyche as well. Because if I've done it, if I've played a gig or, or whatever, I always feel a lot better about the world than I did before. Oh, it's, 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 uh, I did something recently for about the therapeutic value of drumming. Yeah, yeah. And it is, it's a very primeval, primitive thing to do you know very I mean all spiritual stuff in Africa comes around a drum beat yeah and a lot of that is covered in in uh, mad bad and dangerous plus some uh, some some fun and some serious moments and that yeah. hopefully what 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 we've done is draw a little attention to um, the importance of the art etc good um, thanks topper for uh, talking to us that's all right Spike. thanks very much uh, do appreciate it and um, uh, if there's another book would you like to do you oh, like I'd love to, be to. Love to see you again. Well, nice uh, to see you again. Hopefully I'll be in touch. Great to see you again. Don't move. Topper. Thank you. Welcome. I mean, uh, w welcome to us. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to your own home. Yeah, well. Welcome to your house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you.